think the top three reasons why women's health should matter to business leaders is that 51% of the population are women. We know that women have increasingly large percentage roles within the workplace and an enormous role to play in unpaid caring roles. But most importantly, I think we can say that since most of women's healthcare needs are predictable, that we can prevent much of their ill health and that since they're predictable, it's not unreasonable to expect the employer to know something about the, the things that are going to most trouble women and keep them out of the workplace or contributing for as long as possible. And that, of course, has a massive, massive impact on our economy. We've been very slow at picking up on the economic argument, and I think it's a very important one. And I think it's one that most business leaders, even if they don't, even if they're rather new to feeling, trying to feel compassionate about their, their, their female work um, employees, will really understand the importance of trying to retain good people in the workplace for as long as possible. Well, I think the menopause is a particularly interesting time because I'm a, in a generation of doctors who were really trained to work in a disease intervention service. And it was much later in my career that I realised that if we were to focus much more on the prevention and the health and well-being rather than the problems, that we were actually going to save a lot of money, ensure that women have much more fulfilling and happy lives, and also really, really improve the economy of the country. And there is a wonderful saying that the WHO often comes out with and the UN, you know, when you get it right for women, everyone benefits, because it's not just the woman and the employer, it's the fact that this has a beneficial effect on the family, the wider community, uh, everybody benefits. And we also know, of course, as you will be very well aware, that the most successful industries and employment companies now have recognised that when they have women on their boards and greater gender diversity, they actually are just more successful. They bring more, more skills come to the table. I don't think male skills are any worse or any better than female skills, but the mix is the really important thing if you want a very successful company, as witnessed by who's in the FTSE 100 and who's in the FTSE 500. It's a very, very clear distinction about the gender um, participation on the, uh, the senior leadership roles. From the, the menopause, I think it's also very important because it's suddenly sort of been woken, people have woken up to it. And as I say, when I trained, women sort of disappeared from view at the age of 50 because they became menopausal and then it was just, well, that was it. And then we waited for them to come back in 10, 15, 20, 30 years, if they lived that long, um, with a problem. And now we realise that there's so much we can do, not to completely prevent the problems of old age, but in post-reproductive women, you can really postpone the cardiovascular disease to a certain degree, dementia. You can certainly improve mental health and you can certainly really improve um, osteoporosis and frailty. And cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis and frailty are the two big killers. Women are not dying in droves of cancer. They're dying of these very simple um, and very common problems. So, so, so important to actually recognise that my generation is the first generation of menopausal woman who's probably going to live longer post-reproductive than she was reproductive. So I want to live not forever, but I want to live as independently and as well as I possibly can for the time that I've got. I mean, choosing three is quite tricky, but um, I want to make these a memorable thing. So I'm going to call them, well, we could call them the three M's or the three P's. I think I'm going to call it the three P's. So let's talk about periods. Let's keep it very simple. Periods, pregnancy and related issues about pregnancy and the perimenopause and the menopause. Sometimes very difficult for employers to recognise or remember if they're men particularly, or even if they're senior women, you know, people forget that most women have 12 periods a year for nearly 40 years of their lives. And what we heard in the Women's Health Strategy for England um, call for evidence was that the vast majority of women who wrote in saying that they didn't feel their healthcare needs were met we're not talking about very complex things. They were saying they couldn't get advice about their painful, heavy periods or their irregular periods or their absent ones. So that's a big, big issue. And this is such a common problem. And for the most part, it's really simple to sort out, but you have to establish that there is a problem before you can actually signpost women to help. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that every employer becomes a gynaecologist or a period expert, but they can very simply ensure that there's a space for the women to talk, uh, to express their problems, and then to be signposted to good information and hopefully to help as well. Pregnancy, I mean, you know, it is the reason why the human race continues, so it's pretty important. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, historically, women have been viewed, I think, and as an obstetrician, of course, I'm very pleased that we rate pregnancy highly and try to have the very best possible outcomes. But it's a very, very short space in a woman's life towards pregnancy. When you think about our, um, our modern um, North, you know, um, global North countries, um, most women have two, possibly three children. It's not usually more. So that's a very short space of time, because as I often say, Pregnancies only last for nine months. Whatever happens in them, they always end at the end of nine months. And the complications of pregnancy, miscarriage and, um, you know, uh, abnormalities in the baby, these are all very, very emotional things which women find it very difficult to talk about at work because they think they're going to be um, disadvantaged if they're thought to be reproductive and not in the workplace, you know, um, five days out of, out of seven. And then the last one, of course, is the perimenopause. And going through that menopause, it almost usually starts about 45 to 50, can go on for quite some time in the 50s. And I feel so strongly about the fact that those women are at the height of their career, the height of their experience. They are fantastic at mentoring others, being role models for other women. And that, that helps that company because we want to improve the gender balance at the senior level and then we waste them because we don't give them a bit of support and they don't need a lot you know they don't need very you know they don't need a new building or anything like that sometimes they just need to have a bit of flexible time i think covid's helped us with that hasn't it because yeah. covid has meant that we've all thought about this rather differently they may need temperature control they may you know you, it's just, but most of all the women say that they just want to feel comfortable saying that they've got a bit of a problem and that in itself is a real step forward and so i would urge anybody who's listening to this um, to go on to the wellbeing of women website so wellbeingofwomen.org.uk and look at the menopause workplace pledge and if you're an employer of women uh, you can go on there sign up to the workplace pledge and you can get a certificate to say you've done so and it's not complex and it's not onerous but they're asking you to ensure that women have a space to talk, that they're pointed to the right information, and that if they do have particular needs, that you will at least listen to them and make them feel that they are a concern of yours. So Menopause Workplace Pledge on the wellbeingofwomen.org.uk website, please sign up.